Reality as Experience by John Dewey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reality as Experience by John Dewey. There are those who find that the assimilation to each other of the ideas of experience and reality is seriously hampered or even put out of court by the fact that science makes known a chronological period in which the world managed to live a respectable existence in spite of not including conscious organisms. Under such conditions, there was no experience, yet there was reality. Must we not then either give up the identification of the two conceptions, or else admit we are denying and sophisticating the plain facts of knowledge? One is entitled to enter a caveat against any attempt to impose science, whether physical or psychological, as philosophy. One is moved to suggest that the greater the accumulation of interesting and professedly important details, the more urgent the question of what the import and interest are, the philosophic meaning of it all. Yet most empiricists would hardly be willing to adopt any philosophic position of which it could be clearly shown that it depends upon ignoring, denying, or perverting scientific results. Let us then analyze the situation which is offered to justify such charges. It is a situation of which, by scientific warrant, it always is to be said that it is on its way to the present situation, that is, to experience, and that this way is its own way. The conditions which antecede experience are, in other words, already in transition towards the state of affairs in which they are experienced. Suppose one keep in mind the fact of qualitative transformation towards, and keep in mind that this fact has the same objective warrant as any other assigned trait, mechanical and chemical characteristics and relations, etc. What then becomes of the force of the objection? If at some point one shoves a soul substance, a mind or even a consciousness, footnote, consciousness is the faint rumor left behind by the disappearing soul upon the air of philosophy. James, this journal, volume 1, page 477, end footnote. In between the prior condition of reality and experience, then, of course, the suggested implication of identification of reality and experience does not hold. Reality and experience are separable because this heterogeneous factor interposes and makes their difference. It, not reality, is responsible for the transformation. It somehow modifies reality and makes experience out of it, the resulted experience being heterogeneous to reality in the degree in which the intervening mind, subject, or substance is interjective in its nature and sudden or catastrophic in its workings. I am not concerned here with all the hopeless puzzles that now emerge, puzzles which constitute metaphysics in the popular, pejoristic sense of that word. I am not even concerned with pointing out the difficulty, with respect to an experience so constituted, of picking out the features which belong to reality, pure and uncontaminated, and those for which mind or consciousness or whatever is held accountable. I am only pointing out that such a conception is incompatible with the idea that the earlier chronological condition of reality is, for philosophic purposes, henceforth identifiable with reality. For philosophy, reality, on this basis, must include mind, consciousness, or whatever, along with the scientifically warranted early dated world, and philosophy must worry through as best it may with the questions of a reality so hopelessly divided by conception and definition within and against itself. It is, in any case, a notion irrelevant to the particular problem under discussion. I return to the supposedly strictly scientific objection. Unless some heterogeneous kind of reality is shoved in, then the early reality is, at any and every point, on its way to experience. It is only the earlier portion, historically speaking, of what later is experience. So viewed, the question of reality versus experience turns out to be only the question of an earlier version of reality against a later version, or if the term version be objected to, that of an earlier rendering or expression or state of reality compared with its own later condition. We cannot, however, say an earlier reality versus a later reality, because this denies the salient point of transition towards, continual transformation in the direction of. This is the fact which excludes on the basis of science to which we have agreed to appeal, 
any chopping off of the non-contemporaneously experienced earlier reality from later experience. Footnote. I insert this word because it is essential. By hypothesis, this prior state now is experienced, namely, in science, or so far as experience becomes critical. This is the scientific fact on which are wrecked all strictly objectivistic realisms. It is also the fact which, on the basis of a psychological analysis of reality and the substitution of psychological science for physical science as a methodological clue, is perverted into idealisms. Of course, it may be pointed out that this psychological procedure always starts from the body and its organs, the senses, brain, muscles, etc. So that, as Santayana says, idealisms hold that because we get our experiences through a body, therefore we have no body. But, on the other hand, it may be pointed out that this body, the organism, and the behaviors characteristic of it, is just as real as anything else, and hence that an account of reality based upon systematically ignoring its curious attitudes and responses, that is, a philosophy based preferentially upon physical sciences, is also self-contradictory. In such a situation, the important point would seem to be the significance of science or experience in its critically controlled forms, whether physically or psychologically directed. And here is where the pragmatic variety of empiricism, with its interpretation of the place of reflective knowledge or thought in control of experience, seems to have the call. End footnote. So viewed, the question for philosophy reduces itself to this. What is the better index for philosophy of reality, its earlier or its later form? The question answers itself. The property or quality of transition towards, change in the direction of, which is to say the least, as objectively real as anything else, cannot be included in the statement of reality qua earlier, but is only apprehended or realized in experience. In a very real sense, the present experience of the various unenlightened ditch digger does philosophic justice to the earlier reality in a way which the scientific statement does not and cannot cannot, that is, as formulated knowledge. As itself vital or direct experience, as man's experience, which as geologists or physicists or astronomers' formulation is ignored, the latter is more valuable and is truer in the sense of worth more for other interpretations, for the construction of other projects and the basing of projects upon them. The reason the scientist can suppress in his statement of the reality factors which the reality possesses is just because, one, he is not interested in the total reality, but in such phases of it as serve as trustworthy indications of imports and projects, and because, too, the elements suppressed are not totally suppressed, but are right there in his experience, in its extra-scientific features. In other words, the scientist can ignore some part of the man's experience just because that part is so irremediably there in experience. Suppose a theoretically adequate cognition of the early reality as early, prior to the existence of conscious beings, is attained. Call this O. Call its properties lowercase a, b, c, d, etc. Call its laws the constant relations of these elements capital A, b, c, d, etc. Now, since by the evolutionary theory to which appeal is made, this O is in qualitative transformation towards experience, O is not reality complete, is not R, but is a selection of certain conditions of R. But, it may be replied, the theory of evolution does recognize and state these factors of transformation. So be it. But where is the locus of this recognition? If these factors are referred to O, to the prior object, we have the same situation over again. We just have certain additional properties, lowercase e, f, g, etc., with additional functions, capital E, F, G, etc., which, as referred to O, are still in qualitative transformation. Something essential to reality is still omitted. Recognize that this transformation is realized in present experience, and the contradiction vanishes. Since the qualitative transformation was towards experience, where else should its nature be realized save in experience, and in the very experience in which O, the knowledge object, is present? The O, as scientifically known, is thus contained in an experience which is not exhausted in its quality of presenting O as object, 
and the surplusage is not irrelevant, but supplies precisely the factors of reality which are suppressed in the O taken as the chronologically prior thing. The only reason this is not universally recognized is just because it is inevitable and universally so. Only in philosophy does it require recognition. Elsewhere it is taken for granted. The very motive and basis for formulating R as O is in those features of the experience which are not formulated and which can be formulated only in a subsequent experience. What is omitted from reality in the O is always restored in the experience in which O is present. The O is thus really taken as what it is, a condition of reality as experience. This immersion of a knowledge object in an inclusive, vital, direct experience, which terms like immediate are tautological, serving only as warnings against taking experience partially or abstractly, is the solution, I take it, of the problem of the transcendent aspect of knowledge. What is said of the overreaching, diaphanous character of knowledge in relation to its object is something which holds of the experience in which knowledge and its object is sustained and whose schematized or structural portion it is. Every experience thus holds in suspense within itself knowledge with its entire object world, however big or little. And the experience here referred to is any experience in which cognition enters. It is not some ideal or absolute or exhaustive experience. Thus the knowledge object always carries along contemporaneously with itself another, something to which it is relevant and accountable, and whose union with it affords the condition of its testing, its correction and verification. This union is intimate and complete. The distinction in experience between the knowledge portion as such and its own experience content as non-cognitional is a reflective analytic distinction, itself real in its experience content and function. In other words, we cannot dispose of the margin or surplus of the experience in which knowledge is immersed as being emotional and volitional, and therefore just psychological and hence philosophically irrelevant because the distinction between knowledge in relation to its object, qua known, and other supposedly irrelevant features is constituted in one and the same subsequent reflective experience. The experience in which O is presented is one in which O is distinguished from other elements of the experience as well as held in vital connection with them. But it is not one in which the knowledge function is discriminated from other functions, say the emotional and volitional. If the later experience in which this discrimination is made is purely psychological, then the knowledge function itself, as well as the emotional and volitional, is merely a psychological distinction. And again, the whole case falls. In other words, whether taken directly as the scientist's experience or later as the philosopher's or logician's experience, we have the same type of situation that of something discriminated as a condition of experience over against and along with those features of experience of which it is the condition. If one is inclined to deny this, let him ask himself how it is possible to correct supposed knowledge of the earlier history of the globe. If O is not all the time in most real connection with the extra-scientific features of its experience, then is it isolated and final. If, however, it has to square itself up with them, if it enters as just one factor into a more inclusive present reality, then there are conditions present which make for accountability, testing, and revision. To take O as an adequate statement of reality, adequate, that is, for philosophy, is to exalt one scientific product at the expense of the entire scientific procedure by which that product is itself legitimated and corrected. End of Reality as Experience by John Dewey